chapter 22, verse 19 and 20. And he took the bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it. He gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise he also took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. And at this time you can come up Take up this whole communion. Praise God. Just for a few hours, I need to be there. I got, I got to uh, minister at 
the church. And he said, okay, we'll make arrangements for you to be off. The cars was going on. We'll be, we'll be there. So that didn't matter because the good Lord sent the rain yesterday. And we not had I, I work fire duty this time of year for uh, the warehouse. And uh, we don't have any fires today because everything I did is pretty wet. Thank God. He took care of it. So I didn't have to beg for any more time off. But praise God. Uh, after he told me that he wanted me to speak today, I was up in Charlotte on a job up there. I carried a fire engine up there, or uh, they call it a pumper, a small truck, uh, working with Piedmont Natural Gas. I do that quite often too. They burn out gas lines and clean them out. We stand by with the uh, engine in case they set something on fire. We put it out. And uh, so that's, that's part of their safety uh, thing that they have to have a fire engine on site whenever they're burning off those gas lines and cleaning the gas lines out. Because occasionally they'll set the grass on fire, they'll set the brush on fire, or a tree on fire or something, we just spray it out and take care of it. But I was in a motel room up there, and I'm telling you, I don't like to go to Charlotte. It's a busy place. There's a lot happening up there, and it's not my place I like to be. I, I just, when I, God gave me this part of the message, uh, I was, it was about three o'clock in the morning in the motel room, because I had slept what little bit I could sleep, and there was a garbage truck outside beating and slamming, and there was some motorcycles running up and down the road. And, uh, and we were, I was right next to an interstate highway, and big truck running by. So I, I, you know, I'm used to being quiet. I live in the woods. And where I'm at, it's quiet. If you hear something going on, you need to get up and check on us, see what's going on. So uh, I was. Uh, Wake at 3 o'clock in the morning and stay awake the rest of the morning. And I'm reading uh, my studies since the first of the year has been the, about Paul, Apostle Paul, and his writings to the churches. That's what I've been reading and studying for the last the last four months. And uh, I've gone through from Acts all the way through uh, his, his letters to the churches. And I'm telling you, old Paul, he was a he was a strong warrior for the Lord. And uh, he had a lot to say. He had a lot to say to the churches. And he was very, very encouraging to the churches. And that's what I want to try to be for you today as the body of Christ here at Edward Christian Church. I want to encourage you in what's going on here at the church and things that's going on, things that need to take place in the world. And I'm going to try to use some scripture that Paul wrote, some things that happened in his life, some events that took place and, and paint you a picture of, of what was going on then and what's going on now and how it relates to us. We want to boil it all down to how does this relate to Edward Christian Church? Because when he wrote these letters to the churches, he didn't write them just for the church of that day. He wrote them to the churches through the ages. His writings and teachings has come down through the ages and referred and is just as relevant for us today. It's just like the Word of God. It's from yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's forever. And so that's what we want to uh, look at here. Now Paul, you know, in his younger days, he was pretty much against the church. He, uh, he was a persecutor of the church. Everybody knows that. You know the stories. If you've read anything in the Bible at all, you know that Paul persecuted the church to the nth degree. And he was very good at it. And anywhere in... The Judean area, where they uh, the, they heard about somebody talking about Christ, preaching Christ, teaching Christ, they get up with Paul and said they're they're uh, they're speaking blasphemy against the law, and uh, we want you to go get them. And they give him uh, authority to go pull people out of their houses, men and women, and arrest them and put them in jail for speaking about Jesus Christ. And that's all he had to do. That's all he needed hear that they had spoken about Christ, spoken about the new uh, covenant, and though they considered it in their day blasphemy against the law of Moses. So he'd go drag them out, put them in chains, all them off to prison. And that was his job, and he loved it. He was good at it. But one day, as you all know, as he was on the Damascus Road, a bright light shone in front of him, so bright that it blinded him, he fell to the ground. And it was Jesus Christ himself standing before him and spoke to him and said, Why do you 
kick against the pricks. Paul, he called him Silas. His name was Silas at that time. Not Silas. Saul. He said, Saul, why do you kick against the pricks? And Paul asked him, he said, is that you, Lord? Who is that? He asked the question, who, who is that? Who's speaking to me? Lord? And he said, it was I. He said, yeah. This is Jesus talking to you. He said, I want to know why you're kicking against the bricks. Anyway, one thing led to another. They had to lead him away after he saw Vic Christ. They said the ones around him heard something, but they didn't understand. They couldn't understand what was being said. They heard something, didn't know what it was. But Paul did. And that changed his life. We all know that was where Paul made a change. Whenever God himself picked him out. And Paul said, he, he even said after during his ministry, he said, I am the worst of the sinners. He says, no sinner is any worse than I am. And he said, uh, I'm the, he made him an apostle. He said, I'm the least of the apostles. He said, I'm the very one that, that least deserves to be called an apostle. And I got a scripture here that talks about that a little bit. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. Let's turn there just a minute. If you got the time. See what it says. It's just the beginning of the word, and I'll try not to keep it too long. But we'll go through this, and, then, and, and it all boils down to what I really want to bring out. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. Paul said, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle. Now that's, that's how he felt in the back of his mind. But it says, Because I am, he said, The reason I, I am least called least of the apostles is because I persecuted the church. And he, he knew that he had done wrong. And it says in verse 10, there's a big but there. But by the grace of God, and this is great. This is what I really like about this verse right here. First, by the grace of God, it says, I am what I am. And that's what we can all look at ourselves. You are what you are. You're what God created. You are what you've grown up to be. And he said, I am what I am. He said, and that means that I was a sinner. And I may be the least of the apostles. He said, but... That big name, that big three-letter word right there. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And what he is now is an apostle of Christ. And he's a preacher of the word. He's spreading the gospel. He's building churches. And he's ministering all over the land there that they, he lived in at that time. And that word reaches right on down through the ages. And Paul says in scripture, he said, I don't, I don't get my information, I don't get word, I don't get my inspiration from any man or from any teaching. He said, I get it directly from the inspiration of God. He said, it comes from God, that's what he says. <clears throat> he said, Paul realized here that anything that we accomplish for God is done through the guidance and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. His grace prompts us to get busy. His grace of God prompted Paul to get busy, to quit what he was doing, to leave his former life, give up everything he had, and work for Christ. And he did that, and he did it willingly. Because he says in the scripture, if you study it a little bit, he said, anything that I lost in the past is nothing. It means nothing compared to the grace of God and the glory of serving Christ. He was pleased that it all happened, and that he was going through what he was going through. He counted it as gain and not loss. And that he was glad to be where he was at. So his grace prompts us to get busy and not get lazy. That's what God's grace prompts. Is don't go weary. It says in Scripture, don't grow weary of doing good. Don't grow weary of doing good. God wants us to work for him. God wants us doing something for him. He don't want us sitting back. You know, Paul was in prison when he wrote a lot of these letters. And he was ministering to the churches. He was in prison. And he could have said, oh me, Lord, why me? What are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? He could have cowered off in the corner, got underneath his mat, whatever he was sleeping on, and huddled up in the corner and hit his head, buried his head in the sand. And he could have said, I've done all I can do, Lord. I've done all I can do, but he didn't. 
He persevered. He pressed on. He knew that there was more for him to do than what he'd already done. That there was much more that he could do for God. Even in prison, he sent out his letters. He had people helping him. Timothy and others helped him deliver these letters and preach to the churches to what Paul was writing from his inspiration of God given to them to deliver to the churches. Same thing that's delivered to us today through these same scriptures. He said, my grace is sufficient. And that's when, he, you know, Paul, he, had a, he said he had a thorn in the flesh. Nobody knows exactly what that thorn is. There's a lot of speculation. People say, oh, this was his thorn, that was his thorn, that. You don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. And he's praised multiple times for God to take it away from him. God said, Paul, my grace is sufficient. I have what you need. I have what you need to persevere. I have what you need to go forward and grow and work and do a work for me. And uh, you know, grace is something that we receive from God. It's His kindness and goodness. Grace is something that He pours out toward all mankind. But it's something that you can't earn, you can't buy, you can't barter with God to receive it can't make promises to God and say, oh God, if you'll just get me out of this financial situation, I'll serve you the rest of my life. That's not the way you should receive God's grace. You don't make deals with you. You either accept it or you don't. And it all has to be come through the cross. You accept God's grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how you receive it. And once you receive it, it's all yours. Nobody can take it away from you. And Paul received that grace on the road to Damascus. That's what he received whenever the light of Christ shined down upon him. God in Christ himself, the Spirit of Christ, said, why do you kick against the priest? Why are you working against me? Why are you trying to destroy my church, my body? It's a gift free to you. The only way you can do it, can, can receive it in regards to grace is to receive it cross um, because it has to come through the blood of Jesus Christ the sacrificial symbol that we receive here today praise God and I pastor gave a scripture at brother Billy's funeral the other day that I had written down it was Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 I'm going to read it to you it says I have been crucified in Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's a powerful scripture. It was a powerful scripture for him to read the other day because he was referring to Brother Billy. Brother Billy was a true, truly crucified in Christ. The old man died. The old man was buried. And then Christ was resurrected. His resurrection power. That's being crucified with Christ. You cru your sins are put on the cross with Christ. You become a new man, a new creature in Christ. Praise God. Paul's letter to the churches describes where Paul had been and where he was going. The hardships he endured and the experiences of joy in Christ where he celebrated. Seeing God use him even in prison, he considered it an honor to be a prisoner for Christ, even though he was in prison. <clears throat> he knew that there was even more of God to know, so... He was determined to move forward and not just sit back being complacent and expecting someone else to get the job done. And that's what he's expressing to the church today, folks. We here at Edward Christian Church has a work to do for God. We all have a work to do, each and every one of us. Or we're going to sit back and wait and say, well, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will get it done. If Paul had that attitude, there wouldn't be any letters to the churches. Not from him. Yeah, God would probably have appointed somebody else to do it, but it would have been what God's plan was for Paul. <clears throat> he set goals and steps to follow and flow down through the church ages so that we can use the same leadership skills and examples today. I'm going to go to uh, Philippians. Let's turn to Philippians if you've got your Bible. <coughs> Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read a few scriptures here. Philippians chapter 3. 
verse 10. And I'm going to read down through about 15, I think. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Oh, that's a powerful verse right there. Just that one part of the verse. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. If by any means I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of what that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. In that awesome verse, he said, I'm going to try to lay hold of what God's laid hold of me for. And that's what the attitude we need to take. What has God laid hold of us for? He's laid hold of you for some reason. But one thing, he wants to love you. Let's read on. Verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many are, as are mature have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Well, just to read that, hurriedly read over it, it sounds like a bunch of riddles and rhymes. But if you sit down and study it and really look at it and dig into it, it's some of the most power, just as powerful scriptures you'll read anywhere in the Bible. It's strong scripture, that, and I'm going to try to break it down and, and show you just exactly what he was referring to and how it refers to each and every single one of you sitting in here today and everyone else that's not sitting in here that is a part of the body of Christ here. It's for all of us. Each and every one. Praise God. All right. <clears throat> that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Again, that's an extremely powerful verse, a little portion of a verse. Do you know what the power of his resurrection is? Do you really know? Do you understand what the power of resurrection of Christ is? Think about it. What does it mean to you? It means you can be unchanged from the bondage of sin. It means you can be loose from the depression and oppression and darkness of sin in every way. That you've been set free. That's how you become a new creature in Christ, by accepting Jesus Christ. The power of his resurrection. In order for his work to be complete, he has to be resurrected from the dead. And that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that brought him back to be a living spirit, is living in you. Is working in each and every one of us. That same spirit, that same power of resurrection that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of each and every one of us. And we have that same power. We're free from the bondage of sin. You're free from that. You've been forgiven. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, you're forgiven. That don't mean you live in a bed of roses and walk a road that's paved to gold yet. But it means you have to work. Now, you're not working to earn anything. You're not working to earn His grace. You're working because God wants you to work. He don't want you to sit still. He said, occupy until I come. When He left, He said, occupy until I come. That means keep on keeping on. Keep on sharing the Word. Keep on delivering the Word. Keep on witnessing to people. Keep on visiting people that need your that are sick. Keep on helping people that need help. Keep on sharing. Keep on in fellowship with one another in, in Christ. Keep on keeping on. Keep on, he said. Occupy till I return. All right. A point in verse 10 there is believe and meditate on the promises of God. Because one of the promises of God is that you're free from the bondage of sin. Because of resurrection power of Christ. The power of his blood. The power of his life. The power of him taking dominion over everything. Praise God. Paul had full confidence that God indwelling spirit would give him resurrection power the freedom from sin. Uh, the new creature in Christ that he is now to live up to his God given potential. 
in every area of his life. And any task given to him, that same spirit again that raised Jesus from the dead has transformed your life from the old man to the new creature in Christ. Praise God. It's the same thing. And uh, verse 12, 3 and 12. Let me read verse 12 again. Not that I have already attained or am at already perfect. That means he, he doesn't already know it all. He's not completely mature in Christ. None of us are. None of us will ever know it all. There's always more and better. God's, I see the word nevertheless in God's word quite often. That always means more and better. There's always something more and better for you if you, if you follow Christ. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Listen to those words. How are you going to lay hold of what Christ has laid hold of you? How are you going to do it? You're going to have faith. You're going to have trust. You're going to believe in God. You're going to read His Word. You're going to understand it because He's going to give you knowledge and wisdom. All you do is ask for it. There's a lot of things we have because we ask not. We don't have it because we ask not, brother. We don't ask for it. Okay. But if you ask for it, God sees you. You get it in some way, form, or fashion. Praise God. All right. Have a consuming, and in verse 12, it's talking about having a consuming desire to achieve a goal. Paul had a goal. He had a goal to reach out to the churches. He had a goal to keep them away from uh, those that were, weren't preaching the right things, those that were trying to draw them back into the law and live under the law because there was a new covenant in town. There was a new sheriff in town. The law was no longer uh, what they were supposed to live by because the law couldn't save them. Only the blood of Christ could save them. Paul oh, didn't let his weaknesses or fears stop him. He understood that God used his weaknesses and fears to keep him dependent on the strength of Christ. Whatever weaknesses or fears you have will draw you closer to God. It'll draw you closer to Christ if you just, just ask him and just say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to realize I can't do this on my own. There's a lot of things I can't do on my own. And I have to depend on Christ. I said, if I give it to you, Lord, I turn it over to you. You take it. He said, and, and my philosophy is, I'll do my best, and I'll let God do the rest. That's what I, that's my, my theme that I go by. I'll do my best, and I'll let God do the rest. And when he takes over, the job will get done. But you've got to turn it over to God. You've got to let him have a part of it. You got to ask him, you got to seek him, you got to desire him to use you as an instrument to be able to do different things. Praise God. And there's a lot of things that can be done. You don't have to be good. Paul was ministering to all these churches. I read that he had at least 14 churches that he was ministering over. And he had ministers under him that had other churches. See, it was a chain effect. He established a church. Someone would minister in that, he'd minister in that church, and then someone from that church would go out and start another church. And it would go on and on and on. They had churches all over. Praise God. But you don't have to be an apostle or a prophet. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't even have to be a teacher, but a teacher's a good thing. Everybody needs teaching. You know, there's a lot of things. You can walk around this building, you can walk around these grounds. You can look over at the fellowship hall. And look, we've got some folks in this church that's been working hard on getting some things done. And I want you to know each and every one of them. I want to encourage you to keep on. Because that's what I'm, looking, I'm getting at here today. Encourage, trying to encourage you as Paul was encouraging the churches to keep on. To continue on. I'm encouraging you to do something. It was a, a skit or a drama or a song, I believe, I've seen done up here on this stage, and it was said, do something. Do something. And I, it's, it's stuck with me. You know, whether it's paint the handrail out front, or maybe even take it down and have it replaced with a new one, you know, or start a Bible study. Everybody loves a good Bible study. I do. Maybe that's, maybe that's a call that God's drawing you to do. Or maybe a men's fellowship. 
men around here don't do much. They don't have a fellowship group. They don't even have board meetings. Uh oh. No. I'm telling the truth now. I don't want to step in my brother's toes. Men right here, they want to do. They want to do, but somebody's got to step up in the leadership role and get and line them up and get it done. So who somebody got to step up? That's what I'm saying here. Paul stepped up. He could have cowered in his cell and not done a thing, but he did. He said, I press toward the mark. I press on. But somebody's got to step up. There's things around here been neglected for years and years and years. And a lot of it's simple stuff. Very simple stuff. That could be fixed with very little time. But everybody's waiting for somebody else to do it. Paul didn't wait for somebody else to do it. Paul stepped up. He took responsibility. Because responsibility was his to take. Uh, whether it's a uh, men's fellowship group, a prayer group, uh, a group getting together at a certain time and calling each other and go visit somebody at a nursing home. Praise God. Uh, or, uh, there's a lot of things to be listed. Whatever God may be using you says in Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not that you can't do it. It's whether will you or want you to do it. Because life's all about choices. Choices we make. And I'm not here trying to browbeat anybody. I'm trying to encourage you. It's a simple task. And when you, even if it's not so simple, and you get two or three people together to work on something, it becomes a simpler task. I remember back when my grandson was in preschool, he had a little song on him. He said, clean up, clean up, everybody clean up. Because many hands make a light work. Because when they did a task in their class, then everybody would clean up. When's the last time it was cleaned up? around here. Alright, mow the grass. Grass has got to be mowed. Who's going to mow the grass? Brother Billy mowed a lot of grass around here. And then that is entirely going to be missed. Because he mowed a lot of grass. Now he wasn't the only one to mow grass. Others help mow grass. But what are we going to do this year? I don't know. I haven't heard anybody say. But we need to get together and figure it out. Trim the hedges. Hedges got trimmed. Rose bushes got trimmed. And got spruced up. Somebody did some work. And I applaud the ones doing that work. It got done. Somebody stepped up and did it. It wasn't a great big task, but it was a task. It took somebody's time and talent to do. But it got done. The painting, the cleaning, the, just, just different. Changing the light bulbs up and down the side of the building here. It got done. Somebody had to do it, he got done. There's one right there. One of these is out. I don't know which one it is. One of them has been out for a while. I should have done changed it myself. But I had to do it because I'm talking to myself here too. I'm not leaving myself out. Simple task. But who are we waiting on to get it done? Well, pressure wash the building, paint. Maybe same as special up here. Call someone on the phone to encourage them. Say, we missed you. Send them a call. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to be a lone ranger. You can call a friend. Just do something. All right. Philippians 3 and 14 says, I press toward the, his go toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul speaking. He said, I press toward the goal. He's got a goal. And that goal is the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. It's the goal that God called him to do. And God has called all of us to do. Period. To do. Not just sit, warm a pew. That's being a mediocre Christian at best. Breathe some life in your Christian life. Breathe some life into it by finding yourself something that needs. 
something to work on. I mean, it's easy. It's not a hard task. Paul faced more opposition than most of us can imagine. With all the churches he was dealing with, even after multiple, he had beatings, he had stonings, he lost at sea, he was shipwrecked. All these things happened to Paul. Yet he was still sending out the message from prison. Praise God. He remained committed. Choose determination. Be determined. Determined to get something done. Now, and I'm not saying that nobody, that, that anybody here is not doing anything. I'm not saying, insinuating that. If I am, I'm sorry. I apologize. Because some of you are. Some of you are helping other people that's in the church, related to the church. Some of you are visiting. And some of you are, are working here at the church. Some of you are, are ministering. And that's all fine and good. We've got singers that sing up here every Sunday. And that's, that's an awesome task right here to be able to lead praise and worship. It's awesome. It's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Uh, you've got the prison ministry. There's a lot going on. I'm not saying there's nothing going on, but there's more that needs to be done. More. Make more and better. Praise God. Praise God. Choose to be committed to God. Choose sacrificial service and time, talent, and treasures. Choose to get things done. Choose not to just sit and do nothing. Praise God. Have the courage to attempt. Even if you risk the chance of failure. You got to have the courage to try something, to attempt something. If it's something you say, well, you know, I ain't, I'm not so sure I know exactly how to do that. Uh, maybe we need to change a fluorescent bulb or an incandescent bulb or a, the old style fluorescent lights over to you stop. Well, it's, it's really not that hard to do. And uh, the reason I know is because there's some things today on the internet and on the computer that's terrible. I think Facebook can be a terrible thing. Amen. And uh, But I think you can Google YouTube and a lot of that's great stuff because it can tell you how to do something. You can get on YouTube. I, I, I don't know how to work on a vehicle, but I've changed... Uh, axles in my truck and, and changed a lot of different things, worked on it myself, saved me a lot of money. I didn't know how to do that. I just went on the computer and YouTube and they showed me exactly how to get it done. And that's the way tricks around here can be done. You don't know exactly what kind of paint you need or what, what uh, kind of electrical bulb you need. <laughs> you can YouTube and it tell you anything you want to know about it. It's not that hard. Praise God. The, the, the computer can be a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing to be able to and, and take care of it. So, had the courage to attempt something, even at the risk of failure. You might say, well, I'm not the best painter, I'm not the best speaker, I'm not the best teacher, I'm not the best singer. So what? So what? Paul weren't the best apostle. But he took the very worst and made the very best out of it. He did. Same thing with David. Same thing with Many in the Bible, you see that even Moses, he had a hard time getting started. And he had a lot of years under his belt before God ever got hold of him and got him where he wanted him, where he could really use him to bring his, bring his children out of Egypt into the promised land. He had to do a lot of work with him, but he did it. He did it. And we can do it. We can make this place shine. And look, I'm, and the reason I'm saying this is because People walk through that door and they come up on this little yard. Right and by the way, I appreciate the parking lot, the space is getting painted on the parking lot. Somebody did that and they did a good job. And it looks good. It need, been needing done, but it got done. Somebody did it. Praise God. I want to give all of you credit for credit to do because there's been some work being done. We need to continue. I'm encouraging you to continue to work. Praise God. And encouraged to attempt. You say you might not be the best painter, but then I go back to what I say that you do your best and let God do the rest. He'll take over. He'll do it. He'll do it. The men's fellowship idea, yeah. Men need something to do. They need to be able to get together once in a while. Someone might need to take charge of that and say, let's have a meeting. Ladies have meetings. They get a lot done. I want to, ladies, my hat's off to you. You've really been doing a good job. And I encourage all you ladies to participate. 
It says, if they're having a meeting this coming Wednesday night, what time? Seven o'clock. And they get a lot done. They really do. And I think uh, me and folks, maybe we can follow their example. Yeah, I really do. Praise God. Be persistent. Persistence means we're going, we're still going, even when everybody else has stopped. That's persistence. Paul was persistent. Paul had days that he's just like the rest of us when he just inched forward. He was all he could do to get a letter written, get a letter started. It's all he could do to go. And that's the way it is sometimes when we work in the church. It seems like you're only inching forward. You're only getting a little bit done. But if you do a little bit, and someone sees you do it a little bit, it's encouraging to them. And when they, when they get encouraged, they say, look, that, that really looks nice what they've done. That's, that's a good job. Maybe we need to help. Just pick up somebody on the phone, call somebody, say, uh, you've been out there working doing this. Can I help? When are you going to be out there again? Can I help? And it'll catch on fire. It's like a fire. You start a fire with a spark, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows. Soon you got a big fire. And once you get a bigger, the bigger the fire gets, the more attention it gets. Praise God. Hallelujah. Some days it will be all we can do to keep pressing on. Praise God. Hallelujah. Be encouraged, folks. Humble yourself. Paul writes, humble yourself. Not that I have already attained or have already become perfect. And perfect there means to maturity or complete. He didn't huddle up in prison like I said. He got out and did something. He got out and did his work. Another thing he emphasizes in verse 13. Let me read that. Verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but at one but one thing I do, and this is it, forgetting the past. Some things you've got to let go of. Forgetting the past. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, the past is the past. Everything in the past is behind us. It's history. It's gone by. All we can do is look forward to what's ahead. I can look way back in the past around here. A lot of us can. Praise God. And I've, we had some wonderful times in the past. The church, I've seen the church full. We had a lot of young people. But that's the past. You know, when things were booming around here, when we were growing, when we were building, adding on the building, building a new sanctuary, the population in Edward and Aurora was probably... Ten times more than what it is now. The old trailer parks around here was full. Had people in it that worked at Texas Gulf at the time. And it was booming. The roar was booming. With restaurants and grocery stores. They had everything that, that you needed. But that's in the past, folks. That's past. That's moved on. Those people, those young people that came to church here, they've grown up. They've got families of their own. they moved away. Hazel and I had a youth group just that, that we've had for Two or three years. And then those few youth that we had, we enjoyed them. They were a lot of fun. We encouraged them. But they grew up. They grew up and they moved on. They did. They aged out. <laughs> and that's what happens. So that's a season. Everybody has a season, a time and a season. Churches have times and seasons. Seasons come and seasons go. The scripture tells you that. And we've had seasons in the past that we had to let go of. And look forward to a new season. And I believe that a new day is dawning. And right now, right now, it just recently it's been dawning a new day where people are going to take the bull by the horns. They're going to take the horns of the altar and they're going to say, God, use me. Use me. Because we're not giving up, folks. We're not giving up. <laughs> we're, ste we're stepping up. Praise God, there's a difference. We're stepping up. And we're going to do what God asks us to do. Whatever level or point you're at with your relationship with God, whatever you think you can, can or cannot do, listen to Paul writing of encouragement. Believe in the resurrection power living on the inside of you. Have a consuming desire and a zeal to 
do something for God. You know, we answer to God. We don't answer to man, we answer to God. Don't be afraid to think for yourself around here. Don't be afraid to think for yourself. When you see something that needs to be done, do it. I mean, it, it, praise God. <clears throat> Meet that need. You hear or see someone else do it or work, see if you can help them. See if you can be a part of it. Ask them. They may say, well, I don't really need any help. That's fine. Move on. Go find you something else. Praise God. Choose determination and commitment. Life's about choices. Choices you make. You have the choice to sit back and do nothing or you have the chance, choice to decide to do something. Praise God. Have the courage to attempt a work for God no matter how big or how small. Step up. Be persistent. Get things done. You know, a thousand mile journey starts with the first step. A thousand mile journey starts with the first step. Humble yourself. You don't have to be perfect to get started. You do your best let God do the rest. Praise God. Let go of the past. Any bitterness, old mistakes must be left behind. Paul had to let go of his past. He had to let go of his old mistakes. He had to let go of bitterness. He had to let go of the old man that he was and press on toward the mark, the new man that he'd become through the blood of Jesus Christ. Putting on can putting on a can-do attitude. Come together in one accord to be pleasing to the Father with the mindset of Christ. Praise God. One thing that Paul emphasized in all of his writings was the unity in the church. Doing things together. Unity. Being of one mind. The mind of Christ. It was very important to him. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. This is a word of encouragement. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, and the consolation means encouragement, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. That's so what Paul emphasized. Be joyful. Unity of believers in Christ offers a powerful testimony to the world. Now listen to what I just said now. Being joyful, the joyfulness of believers in Christ, the unity of believers in Christ, offers a powerful testimony to the world. People that ride by here, people that come in those doors that haven't been in here before, it's a testimony that the God of love that they preach is real. They practice what they preach, that what they preach is real and active and alive in their lives, making his house an inviting place to come and to become a part of the family of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nobody wants to come into a dirty house, a run-down house. They want their house to look good. They want it to be kept up. I want my house to be kept up that I live in, don't you? Don't you want no, you don't mind kept up, you want yours kept up. This is ours. This is our house. We need to keep it up. We need to dot a little paint on it here and there. We need to put up a little new wallpaper here and there. We need to fix a light fixture. Simple stuff. We need to trim the edges, mow the grass. Things need to be done. You have to mow your grass at your house or either let you pay somebody to do it. You don't live in a jungle. You don't want it to be a jungle around here. God don't want it to be a jungle. He wants it to look good. He's blessed us with this beautiful building, these beautiful grounds, and he expects us to take care of it. Only in Christ can we experience real unity with Christ as your model of humility and service. You too can enjoy a purpose. A Christian attitude, a goal of laboring together. Praise God.
It's easy to become mere observers rather than active participants in what God wants to do in this world. Jesus is coming back. That's a promise. Paul emphasizes that quite a bit. He's coming back. And I've got one more scripture I want to read. Anyway, when Jesus had finished his work here on earth after he was crucified, he died, he was resurrected. He spent about 40 days here on earth revealing himself to different people, the apostles, different ones here on earth. And he went to the time for him to ascend back to the heavens with the Father. The apostles were there, and the heavens opened up, and the clouds received Jesus Christ. He was received in the clouds. And they were standing there gazing up. Well, where'd he go? There he goes. I reckon we're through. But then two heavenly bodies appeared there with them. And what did they tell him? Say, said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up? What are you standing here for? The Jesus that you saw taken up into the clouds will return in like manner in the clouds. He will return. He said, but why are you standing here gazing up? It's time for you to get busy. Don't stop now. Jesus said, occupy till I return. Praise God. All right, brothers and sisters, that's all I have. I, I want this, I pray that this will be an encouragement to you. I had, uh, again, I, I didn't say anything to browbeat anybody because there's a lot being done around here. There's a lot getting done. And I'm encouraging you to continue to get it done. And those that haven't some have, some look, some people stay busy. I know you work day in and day out. And, and I remember when I was younger and my two boys was playing ball. I was out playing ball all night and half the night on the weekends and, and trying to work, keep work up. And it was, we were doing, trying to do church work and it was a constant juggle of time and appointments and trying to be two places at one time. A lot of times Hazel would be going to one thing and I'd be going to another and that's the way life is. But if you got time, tithe your time. You got it. Tithe your time. Do something for God. And make it and you'll, you'll glory in it. Because God will shed His grace on you. Praise God. Let us stand. If anybody needs to come to the altar, just feel free to come. I'm I just pray that God will bless you all. And be blessed because we've got a beautiful place here to worship. A wonderful place to worship that God has blessed us with. And let's do our best to help. The ministry of helps is a powerful ministry. Everybody can't be the apostle or the prophet or the pastor. But everybody can be in the ministry of helps and do their part. I thank you for it. Heavenly Father, I pray you just bless each and every one here to receive this in their heart, Lord. And let it be a word of encouragement to those that have been working and those that have a desire to do your work, Lord. Let it be an encouragement and a blessing to them. Lord, as, as Apostle Paul, Lord, worked so hard even from prison, Lord, even when he was beaten down, he <coughs> still was determined to do your work. And <coughs> let us do our work here, Lord. Let us minister, Lord. And let us be a blessing, Lord, <coughs> as we bless others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.